Mr. Chaudhry, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. The cleansing campaign reached its most brutal apex in Priador municipality. Before the war, evidence shows Priador was a vibrant community with more than 50,000 non-Serbs, P7029, a symbol of brotherhood and unity in the region, according to Radul, and the last place where, ethnic where anyone thought ethnic conflict could happen. That's RM065. After the vicious cleansing campaign led by the 43rd Brigade and the Praetor SJB, as Radul admitted, that symbol of brotherhood and unity didn't exist anymore. Arsic, Zelyaya, and Drilyasha's forces achieved that through widespread destruction of Muslim and Croat villages, homes, mosques, and Catholic churches, through killing more than 1,500 Muslims and detaining thousands more in brutal and inhumane conditions. Now, because both parties have led such detailed evidence about Priador, I'm going to go through it in some detail now to conclude my portion of the presentation. By the time VR, the VRS was formed, Priador authorities, together with the JNA and Priador SJB staff, had seized control of the organs of government in the municipality, taking over power in what defense witness Mandich acknowledged was an implementation of the second level of Variant B. Beginning just days after the formal transformation of the JNA into the VRS, the VRS's 43rd Brigade led attacks on Priador's Muslim and Croat communities. Huge numbers were killed during cleansing operations and in the Priador camps. The initial attacks beginning around the 23rd of May, 1992, were on Hamburin and Kozaritz villages. These were coordinated at higher levels of command. The 43rd Brigade reported to the Corps Command about the, quote, Chechenia of Hamburin. That's P3946, page 139. And Corps Chief of Staff Kalechevich confirmed that, transcript page 37253. And Kalechevich admitted during the cleansing, Hamburin was massively shelled and Muslim civilians were killed. That's 37254. One survivor explained what that looked like. Constant shelling, people packed into basements, airplanes flying overhead, and then she and other civilians fleeing as attacking infantry shelled private <coughs> homes with tanks and burned them <coughs> down. That's P3234, page 7. At P7364, page 2, the 43rd Brigade's bulletin described the attack's purpose, the punishment of Hamburin residents for an armed incident at the Hamburin checkpoint. Similarly, the 43rd Brigade was in contact with the Corps Command in the lead up to the attack on Kozaritz. Zelyaya predicted to Talich, the Corps Commander, that a thousand Muslims would die. Talich, in turn, reported to Milovanovic that Kozaritz was surrounded and blocked and would fall by the next day, P7475. The VRS then shelled and attacked Kozaritz for two days, and a large number of Muslims were killed, as defense witness Yavarich admitted. And we lay out in paragraph 281 of our brief and our scheduled incident chart for Kozaritz the clear evidence that a large number of these killed Muslims were civilians or persons hors de combat. But Mr. Charlie, page four, line, I mean, 1, I thought you gave a number of people killed. Just before, you, before the sentence, as defense, the horrors admitted. 
I, and I, I'd said Zelyaya had predicted that a thousand would die. Yeah, that was much earlier. And then Yavrich admitted, oh, I think I said just uh, a large number of Muslims oh, were killed okay. was his admission. I don't believe he gave a specific number. Now, CSB Banyaluka agent Radulovich gave evidence that this was a, quote, classic scorched earth military action. That's P3207, paragraph 85. P3207, paragraph 85. And indeed, on the 26th of May, CSB Banyaluka reported to the RS MOOP about Hamburin and Kazaritz, quote, several hundred inhabitants of these villages were killed or wounded during the attacks. That's P3434. Thousands more were rounded up and detained. Days later, a group of Muslims tried to retake Praetor town. 43rd Brigade Chief of Staff Zelyaya called Talich and informed him that he was, quote, cleansing everything and would not spare women or children. One survivor explained that this was the closest to the reality of the Muslim and Croats treatment in Praetor, and that's P3273. And that day, the VRS destroyed the Muslim Stari Grad neighborhood in Priador and rounded up the civilians who lived there. Two days later, the First Krajina Corps reported to the main staff 7,000 non-Serbs had been detained in Priador. That's P2875. As they were rounded up, Talich commended the 43rd Brigade in writing for its operations in Hamburin Kozarats and Praetor, while the First Krajina Corps reported to the main staff that, quote, conscripts of Muslim nationality have asked to be released from the units, they expressed their dissatisfaction with the massive destruction of their towns, referring to places including Kozarats. That's P151, page 2. These thousands of detained non-Serbs were held primarily in Omarska, Karaturm, and Ternopoli. The defense tries to blame the civilian authorities for the Praetor camps and distance Mladic from them, and this effort fails. First, the VRS brought thousands of detainees to Omarska, Karaturm, and Ternopoli. Kolechevic, again, acknowledged the VRS took large numbers of prisoners to these facilities. It's at transcript pages 37257 to 37258. You can find more evidence in our Praetor narrative. Second, Ternopoli commander and sexual violence perpetrator Slobodan Karuzovic was incorporated into the VRS under the 43rd Brigade, as we discuss in our Praetor summary, and as I mentioned earlier. Bosnian Serb reports on the camp system while whitewashing the crimes acknowledged Ternopoli was VRS run. That's P2900, page 28, and P5149, page 3. The VRS also helped operate Omarska and Karaturm camps by providing external and some internal security. Military police served as part of the mixed interrogation teams who categorized detainees there. And most fundamentally, of course, the camps were part of the implementation of a common purpose that Mladic shared with the leaders of the RS MOOP and the other uh, Bosnian Serb organs. The crimes committed in these camps were terrible. According to the Serb Red Cross, over 23,000 people, as many as 8,000 at a time, including women, children, and elderly, had passed through Chernopoly by September 1992. 
That's P7199. Those people were subjected to abysmal conditions and treatment, many living outside in the elements, in shelters made of sticks, plastic sheeting, and blankets, using self-dug latrines and foraging for their own food. As described in our brief, VRS soldiers raped women and girls as young as 12 at the camp. And Camp Commander Karuzovich himself perpetrated particularly <coughs> brutal crimes of sexual violence. Men detained there were brutally interrogated, beaten with baseball bats, iron bars, rifle butts, or table legs. shot, cut with knives, and otherwise abused. Care term, as Safet Tachi described, it was a torture camp. That's transcript page 2104. Detainees there were held in inhumane and wretched conditions. They were viciously beaten on arrival before being locked into crowded, blood-stained rooms without enough space to lie down on the bare concrete floors, with no ventilation, little access to hygiene. During the hot summer months, they suffered from malnutrition and starvation. Guards and soldiers, including VRS soldiers you've heard about, Zoran Zigic, Dusko Knezevich, beat many detainees, some of them to death, and soldiers and others raped female detainees there. And Omarska, detainees held there were, as P3414 tells you, afraid of dying every minute, every second. They were afraid of dying because they knew, they saw, heard, smelled, and felt the suffering caused by the thousands of cruel and abusive criminal acts directed at their fellow detainees. They watched as fellow detainees were humiliated, threatened with death, beaten, forced to drink motor oil. They saw and heard crimes of sexual violence. They were afraid to fulfill everyday human needs, like eating or going to the restroom, because they were beaten when they did so. And detainees were murdered. Muslim and Croat political, professional, and intellectual leaders, police and businessmen, were particularly targeted for liquidation. Others categorized as being of no security interest were not released. But the lucky ones were transferred and ultimately expelled. Beatings during interrogation by the mixed teams were frequent, resulting in broken bones and deaths. Other detainees could hear the moans and the cries of the people suffering. VRS soldiers entered the camp and beat and tortured detainees, killing some. Other detainees were forced to carry dead bodies to the lawn by the White House, where almost daily they lay in heaps for other detainees to see before they were eventually taken away. One detainee, when he asked about the crimes against her and her family, in 1992 gave evidence, quote, my life stopped in 1992. Probably my suffering will never come to an end. That's P3242, transcript pages 6237 and 6254. Finally, I want to focus on the week of the 20th to the 25th of July, 1992, 
when the ethnic cleansing of Priador, as we set out in our brief, came to a particular head. Before I go into the details of the evidence about that week, the defense claims that no VRS personnel were involved in burials of people killed during the week of 20th July at the Tomasicha mass grave. Instead, the mass grave has the VRS all over it. Company records reflect machinery was being used by the VRS at the grave site on key days during the week when massacres happened. That's P7422 and 7423. And can we briefly go into private session? We move into private session. An open session. Thank you, Mr. Register. I started with Tomasicha because Tomasicha and Yakarina Kosa are where so many of the people killed during the week of the 20th to the 25th of July were eventually found. This was a week in which almost a thousand people were killed in nine different charged incidents. This slide, made from P2441, highlights the areas that were cleansed. On the left, you see Croat villages, including Brishevo, and running up to Mishka Glava, where a group of more than 100 people was taken to the cultural center, abused, some killed before the rest were taken to Lubia Stadium and eventually another part of the Lubia mine and almost all murdered. Next to it, you see the Burdo and Bishani areas where hundreds of Muslims were murdered, including in Charakovo, in Rizvanovici, in Bishani itself. In the center, a circle around Priador town where 200 Muslims who'd just been rounded up in the Burdo area were murdered in room three at Karaturm camp. On the right, Omarska, where another 200 Muslims from Burdo were murdered. And then at the bottom in the center, Tomasicha, where so many were buried. And to understand the impact of this cleansing, it helps to recall that the green dots not circled in the upper right portion, cluster around, Kozer, cluster around Kozerats, which had been cleansed already at the end of May, and beneath it, Yaskichi and Sivchi, which I won't address today, but which you've received evidence were cleansed in mid-June. Well, the operations in which these people were murdered in July, going back to that week, were ethnic cleansing operations. As the week began, the first Krajina Corps reported to the main staff that Prior was fully under VRS control. P2441 
with Muslim fighters only appearing, quote, singly or in small groups around the Khozarats and Khozarusha villages, P2892. Kolechevich admitted Praetor was under VRS control at this time. It's transcript 37273. <coughs> Indeed, weeks earlier, the court informed the main staff there were only about 100 alleged rebels left in the Praetor area, quote, broken up into smaller groups of five to 10 people, hiding in basements, woods, and underground shelters. They are most often detected either attempting to pull out or searching for food, and if they do not surrender, they are eliminated. With Praetor under total VRS control, VRS officer Slobodan Chumba visited Ternopoli and told the detainee Birdo and Bishani surrendered their weapons, but they would still be, quote, ethnically cleansed pursuant to, quote, policy. That's in paragraph 284 of our brief. The defense claims the hundreds of non-Serbs killed during this week were largely the result of legitimate combat, paragraph 933 of their brief, and to do that, they repeatedly attempt to turn these remaining alleged rebels into a real army, far different from how the First Crying Accord depicted them at the time, and often based on propaganda published by Kozarski Vyaznik. But you've received evidence of massacre after massacre during this week in Brishevo, in Higichi, in Mercalli, in Charakovo, and throughout the Burgo and Bishani regions, as well as the camps to which these people were taken. Official Serb records after the cleansing was over confirm Radul's admissions that Praetor's multi-ethnic community didn't exist anymore and its Muslim community was devastated. P3598, an October 1992 CSB Banyaluka report, noted, quote, dozens of villages have been almost completely destroyed and left uninhabited, specifying Cherikovo, Zechevi, Rizvanovici, Bishani, Rakovchani, all of which you see circled in front of you here, and Hamburin, Kozarusha, Kozarats, Kamachani, which had been cleansed in late May. The CSB noted, quote, this destruction saw the beginnings of the mass exodus of both Muslims and Croats. Now, like other Serb records, they claimed the destruction was a result of combat. But you know from all the evidence about what happened that week, from Kupreshinin's admission Brishevo was unarmed, from the witness evidence about massacres throughout the area, from the 1KK documents reflecting minimal Muslim forces left in Praetor, that, that is a euphemism, that these were brutal ethnic cleansing operations, brutal systematic, comprehensive. What you see on this next slide is those villages mentioned in P3598, which are most relevant to the cleansing campaign in Praetor and included in both P7029, the 1991 census, and P7126, the 1993 Praetor portion of the Republic of Srpska census. As you see, many of the communities I've just been talking to you about by 1993 genuinely, literally, chillingly, no longer existed. Down the column on your left, over and over, more than a thousand people in the Muslim community in 1991, and on the right, no one 
1993, one person. Village after village that did not exist anymore. With that evidence in mind, Your Honors, Mr. Teeger will now address you on count one. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Trowley. Mr. Speaker, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Your Honors, the crimes about which you have just heard were part of the organized effort to demographically reconfigure Bosnia to create a factual situation that would ensure a Bosnian Serb state in the areas they claimed free of historical enemies. The crimes they used to achieve these results, including genocide, were part of the common purpose. As the prosecution brief details in paragraphs 167 through 174, paragraph 282, it was clear that ethnically reconfiguring Bosnia's intermingled population would not happen, as we've heard, by magic but would require great crimes. Separating people from everything they have, from their homes, from their communities, possessions, livelihoods, cannot realistically be accomplished without crimes at a level sufficient to overcome people's natural resistance to abandoning everything they have, know, and love. JCE members were well aware and indeed threatened the level of violence that would be used to achieve the objective, up to and including, quote, disappearance, unquote, and, quote, extinction, unquote. They prepared their followers to use the necessary force and violence, imbuing the message that Serbs faced a genocidal attack. By way of just one of many examples, General Mladic told the VRS symposium, quote, Ustasha and Islamic hordes, which have for decades in secret and from within the bosom of our people been preparing its extermination, unquote. You'll recall that Ambassador Oken recognized the relationship between such characterizations and a, quote, preemptive genocide, unquote. These crimes became almost instantly notorious and known to the world, and internationals protested repeatedly to Mladic and Karadzic about them. And knowing how the forcible removal was being implemented, JCE members deflected criticism, defended the crimes, praised the results, promoted rather than punished the perpetrators, and worked to cement the results of those crimes. Threatened it, implemented it, maintained it, praised it, rewarded it, cemented it. Why? Because these crimes, including genocide, were necessary means to achieve the desired permanent removal of unwanted Serbs from coveted territories. Sorry. And I should have be corrected to say unwanted non-Serbs from coveted territories, the transcript should read. Your Honors, I will be discussing count one genocide in the context of the crimes against Priador's Muslim community. And I do so because, as you have heard, the level and intensity of the crimes deployed in Priador strikingly illuminate the factors bearing on destructive intent as well as their existence. 
Now, that same analysis applied to the facts in Priador <coughs> can then be used by the trial chamber to assess the inferences that can be drawn from events that occurred in other municipalities and other charged genocidal municipalities and of those groups. And while the trial chamber may find that count one has been established by taking the six genocidal municipalities in the aggregate, uh, it must otherwise uh, consider each municipality on its own. Now, as we see on the screen and as we know, genocide is the convergence of these listed prohibited acts under Article 4 and in Section 2 of Article 4 with an intent to destroy the group in whole or in part. 4.2a, killings. In this case, as you know, we, in the context of a community of 49,000 Muslims, more than 1,500 civilians were killed. That's at least what has been shown by the evidence related to the scheduled incidents and the demographic evidence. But recall also that General Mladic understood in 1993 that 5,000 Muslims had been killed, and no one appeared to blink at that number at the time. And that's found in our brief at paragraphs 350, 376, and in the Priador summary at paragraphs 1 and 57. Art, uh, 4 to a, a B and C, as you've heard, many thousands were rounded up and held in detention, as many as 7,000 in Omarska and Kara term, two terrifying facilities where murder and torture were commonplace, where detainees were slowly starved, crammed together in filthy conditions without sufficient water or medical care, terrified that they would be the next to be beaten, tortured, or killed, fearing death as we learned, quote, every minute, every second, unquote. That's at paragraphs 357 through 58, 362, and 364 of the prosecution brief. After a matter of weeks in these facilities, they were emaciated, even skeletal as you've seen from the evidence. And this descent towards death was halted only by the fortuitous exposure of the camp by the international media. Now, this saved the lives of many prisoners, as recognized by Patty Ashdown when he saw the detainees who had been transferred to Manyacha, which was itself a brutally substandard facility, but a quote, unquote, hotel in comparison. That's at paragraph 365 of the prosecution brief. Many thousands more were held in Ternopoli, a way station of despair prior to being shipped out to an uncertain fate, and a facility with its own horrors, where rape was rampant, food uncertain, hygiene intolerable. Thus, Your Honors, against the brutal backdrop of a pattern of serious physical harm, that's 4-2-A, and the even more pervasive serious mental harm arising from day after day of torture, terror, and deprivation inflicted in the prison camps, 4-2-B, thousands of people were also subjected to acts falling within 4.2c, which concerns, quote, methods of destruction that do not immediately kill the members of the group, but ultimately seek their physical destruction. That's at the Ptolemyr uh, Appeals Judgment, paragraph 225. So thousands and thousands and thousands of crimes, each one of which satisfi satisfied the actus reus of genocide. This leaves the question whether the acts occurred with genocidal intent, with the intent to destroy the group as such in whole or in part. The defense argues that the targeted portion of the group, 
either individually or in the aggregate, is not a sufficiently substantial part of the Bosnian Muslim or Croat population of BH. That's found at paragraph 3055 of their brief. To the contrary, Your Honors, as outlined in paragraphs 383 through 389 of our brief, the tribunal has found that the object and goal of the Genocide Convention admit a finding of genocide even when the intent extends only to a limited geographic area, such as a municipality. And that's found at paragraph 385 of our brief. And when you look at Priador, you see the following. Its Muslim co community was roughly the same size, indeed larger, than Srebrenica. Further, just as Srebrenica was powerfully emblematic toward the end of the war as a beleaguered holdout observed by the international community, Priador at the beginning of the war was a powerful symbol of World War II to the Bosnian Serbs and thus of the vulnerability of Muslim-majority areas claimed on the basis of that rationale. And it was also powerfully emblematic of brotherhood and unity as you heard from Mr. Trawley. The very concept that the Bosnian Serb leadership sought to replace with ethnic division. Priador therefore falls squarely within the tribunal's jurisprudence as a cognizable part of the group protected by the Genocide Convention. And I direct your attention also to our brief at paragraph 384. Now moving on to the defense arguments about intent. The defense asserts that what happened to Priador and the intent behind it does not constitute genocide because any, quote, discriminatory approach, unquote, to killings contradicts an intent to physically destroy the group. That's found at their brief at paragraph 52. In other words, if the perpetrator doesn't intend to kill every individual member of the group, genocidal intent is negated. Now this is a somewhat common misunderstanding arising from the general association of genocide with the best known uh, destructive attacks on groups such as the Holocaust or Rwanda. But contrary to this misimpression, as the list of genocidal acts itself makes clear, Killings represents only one potential aspect of a destructive attack on a group. For example, Article 4.2e, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group, does not result in the physical demise of any group member. Indeed, does not impact the physical or biological capacity of the individual members. Its destructive effect, its destructive impact, is that effect on the group's capacity to, quote, renew itself, unquote. That is, renew itself as a group, a separate and distinct entity, which is what the Genocide Convention protects, the group. And you can see that in the application of Genocide Convention in the ICJ, the Croatia versus Serbia case, in February of 2015, that judgment at paragraph 136. Now, a related misconception is that forcible transfer is incompatible with destructive intent because people who are transferred are not killed. To the contrary, as the jurisprudence again makes clear, when forcible transfer accompanies an attack which includes acts prohibited under the Genocide Convention and under Article 4, it may be, quote, an additional means by which to ensure physical destruction, unquote. And that's found at the Kerstich Appeals Judgment at paragraph 31. And it is a powerful indicator of the intent to destroy the group as such, as Kerstich also makes clear. So while it is true that forcible transfer in and of itself does not constitute genocide, this is not a case of pristine forcible transfer. 
Expulsion operations, as you vividly heard, were generally preceded by violent and inevitably terrifying attacks on homes, villages, and towns. Family members were wrenched from their homes and from each other. Many victims were then detained in horrific conditions for long periods prior to being expelled. They were then cast into the anguish of exile, trying somehow to cope with the loss of their homes, their communities, their livelihoods, and too often with the additional pain of losing or not knowing the fate of loved ones. Tribunal case law has recognized the harm caused to victims of forcible transfer in traumatic circumstances such as these as genocidal acts. And that's at the Tolomir Appeals Judgment, paragraphs 210 through 212. Your Honors, forcible transfer is an additional means of destruction because it undermines the long-term ability of the group to, quote, reconstitute itself, unquote, as a community. That's Kerstich Appeals Judgment, paragraph 31. And that finding, once again, reflects that destruction within the meaning of the Genocide Convention and Article 4 turns on the intended impact of the genocidal and other acts, that impact on the capacity of the group to survive as a group and not necessarily on the physical destruction of individual members. Attacks on the group that are not aimed at the physical destruction of group members may and often do contribute to the destructive effect, to the destructive effort, and reflect very clearly the genocidal intent. The defense also argues that targeting leadership could only affect the, quote, functionality, unquote, of a national group and could not affect its, quote, physical survival, unquote. That's found at paragraph 53 of their brief. Now, again, this erroneously equates genocidal intent with an intent to physically destroy all members of the group. And it also ignores the jurisprudence, which has recognized that targeting leaders may indeed, uh, quote, amount to genocide and reflect genocidal intent. You can find that at the Ptolemyr Appeals Judgment at paragraph 263, also the Yelisich Trial Judgment at paragraph 82. And this is due, as the jurisprudence explains, to the impact that elimination of the leadership has on the, quote, fabric, unquote, of society, that is, the bonds that hold the group together as such, that make it a group as such. And for that, you can see the final report of the Commission of Experts established pursuant to Security Council Resolution 780. Uh, that's at paragraph 94, relied upon by the Ptolemyr Appeals uh, Judgment. And why is that the case? Because a group is not a physical or biological entity it exists by virtue of the bonds between its members, the cohering factors that allow it to exist as a group, as such. It's exactly the point of the Genocide Convention. And you can find reference to that in the Kreishnik Trial Judgment at paragraph 854, footnote 1701. For the same reasons, Your Honors, the jurisprudence has recognized as you'll be aware, that sexual violence has a destructive impact on not only the direct victims, but also their families, communities, and the, quote, group as a whole, unquote. And see paragraphs 360 and 368, uh, and paragraph 731. Once again, Sorry, this- paragraph, those paragraphs? Uh, in the prosecution brief. Thank you. Once again, oh, I'm sorry, at, it's paragraphs 360 and 368, and I also want to direct your attention to Akiyesu at paragraph 731. Thank you. 
Once again, this broader destructive impact is not a, member, a, matter, a matter of physically destroying individual group members, but it's a matter of the rupturing or undoing of family and community bonds that results from sexual violence. Now, it's important to note that this is distinct from, quote, cultural genocide, unquote which is concerned with attacks merely on cultural or sociological characteristics of the group, and as we know, does not represent destruction within the meaning of the Genocide Convention. But conduct that includes specified genocidal acts under the Convention, and that is intended to prevent a group from continuing to exist as a separate and distinct entity, is distinct from conduct that instead targets the cultural or sociological characteristics of a group, but allows for its continued existence as a separate and distinct entity. The defense also asserts at paragraph 88 of its brief that the quote intent, that quote the intent, unquote, of the accused did not extend to the destruction of the Bosnian Muslim Croat peoples. Rather, the defense claims, his, quote, primary objective, unquote, was defending the Bosnian Serb people against, quote, subjugation, unquote. It's at paragraphs 87 through 88 of their brief. This claim, which focuses on the alleged reasons behind General Milotic's conduct, represents a conflation of motive and intent. As the Stockage Appeals Chamber made clear, goals, objective, motive, that is the reasons that prompt someone to act, are distinct from the means intended to bring that about. And the Stockage Appeals Chamber held, quote, in genocide cases, the reason why the accused sought to destroy the victim group has no bearing on guilt, unquote. And that's at paragraph 373. Um, that's, excuse me, the Stockage Appeals Chamber, paragraph 45. The existence of personal motive, whether hatred, or greed, or the desire to protect your own group from the alleged threat of subjugation, simply, quote, does not preclude the perpetrator from also having the specific intent to commit genocide, unquote. And that's from the Yelisich Appeals Chamber, paragraph 49. A similar risk of conflation can arise in cases involving a JCE to permanently remove through crimes including genocide. It is erroneous to suggest that destructive intent is negated because the quote unquote intent was to permanently remove instead. In fact, the objective of permanent, permanent removal merely begs the question of the means employed to bring that about, to achieve that goal. So by way of a fairly elementary example, if I desire someone's apartment and one night throw in a canister of poison gas, it is no defense to a murder charge to say, I didn't intend to murder him, I only intended to get him out. Getting him out may have been my reason, my motive, but the means employed, the means purposefully employed, clearly reveal my intent. So the question is not whether the means reflect an intent to destroy the group. Excuse me, the question is whether the means reflect an intent to destroy the group as such, and not the objective which the means seeks to fulfill and those should not be confused. And as charged in this indictment, 
There's a common purpose, quote, to permanently remove Bosnian Muslim and Bosnian Croat inhabitants by means which included the commission, and it goes on, of a number of crimes, including genocide. In short, General Mladic may not find refuge in any of the reasons that led to, that motivated the murders, detentions, burnings, expulsions to which the Priador Muslim community was subjective, subjected. And that given their magnitude, pervasiveness, brutality, reflected nothing short of an intention to destroy that community. And that intent, Your Honors, is reflected not only by the repeated expressions of JCE members about the level of force that would be employed if the Muslims and Croats continued to pursue independence, force that would result in their disappearance or extinction or vanishing, but in the expression of satisfaction at the results. In late October 1992, relatively short time after the most brutal phases of the destruction of the Priador Muslim community had been implemented, General Mladic and other members of the Bosnian Serb leadership gathered in Priador for an assembly session. As Mrs. Plopsic said, it was no accident that Priador had been selected. Quote, we had in mind everything that had happened in Priador, unquote. General Mladic considered that the people of Priador had, quote, every right to be proud of their fighters, unquote. And he expressed his pride in their efforts by approving the promotions of some of the key implementers, including General Talic and Colonel Zelyaya, who, as you heard, had threatened to raise Kozarets to the ground unless non-Serbs complied with his demands. You can find that at, par at the prosecution brief, paragraphs 281 and 487, and the Priador summary at paragraphs 56 through 58. The Bosnian Serb leadership took the position that Priador had to be theirs because it had been a Serb majority area before World War II. You can find that at transcript 34091 through 92 and at the citations in paragraph 387 of the prosecution brief. Given Priador's demographics in 1992, that objective required the Army to produce a new factual situation, a new factual situation that the international community and the Muslims would be forced to accept. The means to achieve this factual situation were brutally effective. And when in a community like Priador, more than 1,500 people are murdered in a short time, thousands and thousands more starved, degraded, abused, humiliated, tormented in abominable detention facilities, either slowly sliding toward death or brutally killed, when most of their homes are destroyed, when their mosques are reduced to rubble, and when they are scattered to an impoverished exile, the intent to destroy that community and prevent it from reconstituting itself is unmistakable. And the word for those crimes with that intent is genocide. It's time for the break. When we resume, yes. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Weber will address the uh, chamber on the terror JC in Sarajevo. Yes, so you have finished your presentation on this subject. Um, we take a break and we resume at uh, until no, we we'll resume at 25 minutes to 2 o'clock. All rise. We will leave it.